Uh, thank you all. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to be here. Let me start with a little bit of history uh, that I think will set some of the, some of the tone for uh, the changes I'm seeing now. So in the, early 19, in the late 1990s, rather, a guy named Larry Sanger, uh, who was an epistemologist, somebody who specialized in the study of how we justify belief, lucked out. He got one of the few open positions available for epistemologists. Uh, he was hired to help develop a new encyclopedia. It was called Newpedia, N-U. Uh, and there was a lot of this in the air at the time, right? There were other encyclopedia projects going on with names like Everything 2 and H2G2. And Newpedia was going to be another of these online encyclopedia projects. And the thing that characterized Newpedia was that they were going to recruit experts to write the articles, and they were going to build a rigorous process for developing and certifying and vetting and fact-checking the articles before they got published. So they, de they design this process, they recruit these experts, they get going, but they don't get going very far. And about nine months into Newpedia, they have created something like a dozen articles. Right? So the pace of this, not fast. And they're funded like a startup, so they don't have a huge amount of money, and Sanger can see the writing on the wall. So he goes to the guy that hired him, Jimmy Wales, and he says, this Newpedia thing isn't working. We've got to try something else. Ward Cunningham has this thing called Wikis. It's kind of a collaborative editing site. Why don't we try Wikis as a way of just getting this going? We'll jumpstart the creation of articles. So seeing no other alternative, they put up a Wiki. Sanger recruits some people to write some stub articles. And thus, of course, is Wikipedia born, and the rest is history. Right. Within months, Wikipedia had generated far more articles than Newpedia had in its entire highly planned life. And by the end of that year, Newpedia had shut down and Wikipedia was off to the races. <clears throat> so hold that thought. In August of this year, in New York, where I live, uh, a guy named Patrick McConlog, who was a 23-year-old who works at a company called Kick-Ass Capital in New York. Walking back and forth between home and work, as one does, and he saw a lot of homeless people, as one does, but there was one guy that stood out to him. He said, well, that guy, he doesn't seem completely distracted. He doesn't seem completely decimated by his situation. And McConnell put up a post about this observation of his, about this homeless guy. And the title of the post was, Finding the Unjustly Homeless and teaching them to code. And McConlog's strategy was to go to this guy and say, I'll either come I'm gonna come back tomorrow and I'll either give you 100 bucks, or I'm gonna bring you three books about JavaScript and a laptop. <laughs> yeah, you can, the laughing began almost immediately when this post went up, and it went on in that vein, right? First of all, the intimation that there was such a thing as the unjustly homeless, and you could sort those people out from the justly homeless. Uh, he went on and made a whole plan for this guy's life without bothering to learn his name. In the first post, he calls him the journeyman hacker, right? And the internet, as it does, exploded, right? The criticism was widespread and instantaneous, and the details just kept adding up. McConlog's crunch-based profile, first of all, he has a crunch-based profile. McConlog's crunch-based profile is him standing on a boat behind the captain's wheel, holding a tall boy, right? <laughs> did, I, did I mention that McConlog was white? You probably had figured that out by now. And that Leo, which turns out to be the homeless guy's name, Leo was black. You could probably have guessed at that, too. It just goes on and on. So I got interested in this, and I started reading the criticism. And it was widespread, and it was voluminous. And I came across a piece by Noreen Malone in, uh, in the New Republic. And Malone said that don't bother me with the factual limitation style dreaming can be useful for startups, but it's not so useful for thinking about social problems. And that phrase brought me up short because that doesn't sound right, does it? Right? It can't be the case that if you're thinking about social problems, you have to accept that all existing constraints are immovable. That doesn't even sound like problem solving. That sounds like capitulation. So then I went back and I started reading the criticism again, but now with a new eye towards this sense of 
is this a problem we can move or not? And I started reading the comments as well. And the comments on these articles, again, all over the map as comments are. Some of the people in the comments said, look, the guy's trying to do something. It's obviously ham-handed. It's cringeworthy even, but at least he's doing something. Cut him some slack. But there was another group in the comments that was unbelievably harsh. But they weren't being harsh to McConlock. They were being harsh about Leah. Right? There were people in the comments, never laid eyes on this guy in their lives, who were willing to say, he's obviously an alcoholic. He must be addicted to drugs. He's probably a thief. The people who were the harshest to the homeless guy that everyone was talking about were the people who assumed that McConlog was going to fail, and it became clear in a way that they wanted him to fail. That whatever else he'd done, he'd offended their sense that homelessness was an intractable problem. And I realized I'd been reading the criticism wrong. I'd been reading the criticism saying, I agree with this and I don't agree with that. This one seems right, that one seems wrong. But that wasn't what mattered about the criticism. What mattered about the criticism was, is it helping or not? So Matty Iglesias wrote a, wrote a very thoughtful piece criticizing McConlog and this idea of, of saving the homelessness, homeless by teaching them JavaScript. And he said, look, we know the problem with homelessness. We know the problem the homeless have is they lack homes. Right? You solve that problem with housing first. If you don't do that, nothing else will move. Right? And you can have a lot of reactions to that. You could say, that's interesting. I didn't know about that research. I'm going to change what I'm doing. You could say, I think in New York City it's different, or I think for some classes of homeless people or some situations it's different. But almost any reaction you could have to Iglesias' post would make you smarter. That's helpful criticism. Helpful criticism says, I see what you're trying to do there. I don't think it's going to work. But come stand where I am. Let me show you what the world looks like from my point of view. And then there was other criticism. Again, as harsh as Iglesias, as skeptical as Iglesias, but with a very different tone. The tone of this criticism was corrosive. It didn't say, come stand where I am. It said, stop. Just stop what you're doing. It didn't say, take a different tack at the problem. It said, go away. Corrosive criticism is, is addressed to the person solving the problem, not the problem itself. So if you're listening to helpful criticism, it's not like it's all happy and shiny. Right? Much helpful criticism is tremendously harsh, and responding to it is painful. But the real question is, does responding to it make you smarter? Corrosive criticism is not like that. Corrosive criticism is almost by definition designed not to make you smarter about the problem. And seeing this, seeing this tension between these two kinds of criticism of McConlog, I thought there's no easy way to characterize what McConlog is trying to do with, to, for Leo, the homeless guy. There are some parts of it that are good. There are some parts of it that are bad. There's no simple solution. There's no point of view you can adopt that clarifies everything. And I thought, I recognize this. This is the sorting out time. Right? Now, I've lived through the sorting out time for two other things. One, questions of general utility of the web. And the other is the possibility that social media will work and matter and spread. And it generally goes like this. Some new tool comes along, and people look at it and think, I can do new things with this. Right? Any new technology makes new things possible. That's, that's what it does. If something doesn't make new things possible, it's either not new or it's not a technology. But when you get a new technology, you don't know how to use it, so you go around looking for places where it might fit. And this is often criticized as, oh, that's a tool in search of a problem. But of course it is. When we got hold of the web in the early 90s, nothing in the world looked like the web. So we had to say, does it fit here? Does it fit there? Right? Selling plane tickets didn't look like the web. Selling books didn't look like the web. Search engines hadn't even been thought of yet. And the reaction to that stuff in the beginning is, oh, that won't work. And then it starts to work. So then the reaction is, well, that won't last. And then it starts to last. And then the reaction is, well, that won't scale. And then it scales. Right? And then you get to the sorting out time. 
Then you get to the point where everybody realizes this stuff is actually embedded in what's possible in the world now. It happened with the web. It happened with social media. Reading this thing with McConlog and Leo, I think it's happening now with the idea of a civic media. I think we're past the point where the easy, the easy ideas and the easy answers are what characterizes the debate. It isn't just about finding potholes anymore. Right? It isn't just about adopting fire hydrants. Right? We're stretching into the part of the system where we're actually having to figure out what fits where and why. And that's why sorting out the difference between helpful and corrosive criticism matters so much. You have to listen to the helpful critics, even if they're mean, even if they're harsh, even if they're angry, because responding to them will make you smarter. You can't afford to listen to the corrosive critics. Not because they're wrong, they're almost always right. If you want to feel like a genius, go find someplace where people are trying to do something new and tell them that they'll fail. You'll be right nine times out of 10. 19 times out of 20. You don't even have to understand the problem they're working on. The algorithm is very simple. While one, predict failure. And you'll get it right most of the time. It's a cheap high. Right. But the thing the corrosive critics want you to believe is that the sentence, almost nothing will work, which is obviously true, is the same as the sentence, nothing will work which is completely false. Every success in human history has passed through the eye of that needle. Every success in human history has threaded its way past almost nothing will work. And so to understand where you are in trying to take on a problem and solve it, you have to figure out what it is you're committing yourselves to, what kind of resources you're marshalling, and where you fit how you're taking on the problem, and how the problem is defined. The easiest problems to take on, the great problems, are just technical problems. Right? They're problems where you just don't have the information you need to solve the problem. And if, you've got it, if you're working on something where you just need more information, and you're working with digital tools, this is paradise. Right? It's no accident that the poster child for this kind of work in the last decade was pothole fixing. Because there is no pro pothole lobby you have to go up against, right? <laughs> Maybe the mayor's brother-in-law owns an asphalt plant and it's a little more expensive than you'd like to fix the potholes. But really, the problem is just informational. If I can identify where the potholes are, I can do a better job. And this is great. Potholes are a problem. Problems have solutions. Best, best of all possible worlds. If you're working on a technical problem, you can make rapid progress without a lot of political issues. One up from the technical problems are the managerial problems. Managerial problems are where there's a tension between the government and what the government is trying to do, and the citizens and what the citizens are trying to do. And there, very often, you have to negotiate things in a more complicated way. Right? When New York City launched its bike sharing program, it put up a map and it said, basically, where do you want there to be a bike station? And of course, everybody said, click, I want one right by my home, and click, I want one right by work. Right? Now, this looks like the pothole problem, right? Just help us identify street corners where these things might work. That was the public rationale for putting up this map. We're crowdsourcing where the bike station should go. The secret rationale was for people to log into the map and say, oh my god, a lot of people are excited about this bike sharing program. The map didn't just surface information, it legitimated and helped create a constituency for the bike sharing program in the first place. Managerial problems are considerably more complicated than technical problems because they require not just information, they require political will, they require communication with the citizens in more than just to mail us a picture of a pothole with an attached lat long. And then up from managerial problems are political problems. Political problems are the hardest of all. Political problems are where there's disagreement even inside the government as to what constitutes a possible way forward. Right? It is possible to imagine a city with no potholes. It is not possible to imagine a city with no prostitutes. And so there is no way to take on the problem of prostitution because people don't even agree as to what the goal is. 
And I don't just mean it as a left-right split. That's normal in American politics. I mean, even within coalitions, right, at the, at the extremes of the progressive left, there are people who want sex work to stop, and there are people who want sex work to become a better job. And there's never going to be any solution to that problem because the problem resists easy definition. Once you're up at the political level, you're not dealing with problems anymore. You're dealing with dilemmas. And you don't have solutions. You only have trade-offs. And you have to understand what the trade-offs are. So if people want to distract you as they will want to distract you, whenever anybody tries anything new, someone will try to distract you. The easiest way to do that is to intimate that the problem you're working on is not the real problem. If you're working on a technical problem, if you said, I, just ha I have to get more information to solve this problem, I can come in and say, well, yeah, you're working on potholes, but you really need to be working on improving traffic flow citywide. Right? Your little thing isn't good enough. Right? And if you're taking on a giant political problem, like increasing traffic flow citywide, I can come in and say, that's totally impractical. You should be working on the potholes. I can always distract you by intimating that the level you're working at is the wrong level to be working at. One of the reasons you have to understand what it is you're trying to do is to keep from getting distracted with either larger scale or smaller scale problems. You also have to understand where you fit. Are you just trying to gather information? Are you trying to bridge a gap between the citizens and the government? Or are you actually trying to hash out some fight inside the government? And those last problems, the political problems, are the hardest of all. It's an as an example, right? shared citizen budgeting, the Porto Alegre process, right? has been around and well documented and works and has good effects, and yet it spreads very, very slowly because anything that touches the political part of the process is really hard to change. And all of this matters this sorting out of the helpful from the corrosive criticism and knowing which level of the problem you're trying to take on. Because the most important resource you've got isn't your strategy or your plan or your tactics. It's not your tools or your technology or your project management. The most important resource you've got is your own ability to change your mind. That's what matters over the long haul. So as I was getting on the plane to come here yesterday, I got a funny piece of news. Leo, the homeless guy with the laptop and the JavaScript books, got arrested yesterday morning. NYPD pulled him off the bench and took him downtown and arrested him for sleeping in the park because he doesn't have any place to go home. And McConlogue shows up to their usual meeting spot yesterday morning, sees Leo gone, sees the coffee cup, sees his coffee cup kicked over, realizes what's happened, goes to a nearby traffic cup, says, the guy that sits on the bench right there, did you see where he went? Traffic cup says, yeah, he got arrested. And McConlogue goes downtown and tries to get Leo bailed out of jail and tries to get his laptop, which has been confiscated, back. That's still going on now. There's no resolution to that. Leo's still incarcerated, his laptop is still in police possession, but McConlogue is working. And this may work, right? McConlogue has an enormous amount of resources at his disposal. Uh, they've got a ton of media attention now, in part because of the kerfluffle that McConlogue kicked off a couple of months ago. So if things go well for Leo, it's not going to be because this is a general solution to some sort of problem of homelessness. This will be, this will be a fairy godparent story. Right? But as Tim Malley's pointed out, fairy godparents don't scale. But that's, that's not, I think, the important part of the story. The important part of the story is that McConlogue went from being a guy who felt comfortable characterizing people as the justly and unjustly homeless. This is a guy who felt comfortable talking about the homeless without even bothering to learn the name of the person he was targeting. He's turned from that guy into a guy who takes time out of a workday to try and get his friend bailed out of jail. And I'll tell you, as a New Yorker, nobody voluntarily interacts with the NYPD. <laughs> right? That's a big change. 
And it may not matter in the long term. This may just turn out to be a story that McConlog tells his friends next time he's on the boat about this one time he did this one thing. That can certainly happen. But what is clear is that McConlog would not have learned what he's learned about the problems with homelessness, the problems the homeless face, if he hadn't started out with the wrong idea and been willing to test it in the world. It's not the people who do nothing who learn new things. And that, that possibility, the possibility of learning as you go, that's the essential resource in this room. Governments get this wrong all the time. Government is almost designed to get this wrong. Government said, oh yeah, we had that big project and we did all that planning and it didn't go well. I know, next time we'll just plan harder, right? <laughs> You can't just plan harder and get where you need to go. You can't get a rocket to the moon by just aiming better at launch. You have to start with course correction. The other extreme doesn't work either. The people who say, I know, we'll have a hackathon unconference and we'll develop a solution. Right? That doesn't work either. Hackathons don't come up with solutions. Hackathons come up with a kind of hand-wavy mashups you can do in a day and a half. Right? The output of a hackathon isn't a solution. The output of a hackathon is a better understanding of a problem. The product of a hackathon isn't running code. It's the social capital developed among the people in the room. So we've all gone to school. People in my tribe have all gone to school on the Newpedia story. We all know Newpedia failed because they were so process heavy. As anybody who's ever been in a bureaucracy knows, when you have a seven step process for developing something, as Newpedia had, what you have is seven different places where things can grind to a complete halt. Right? And we've learned that story. But there's a deeper story there, right? which is this. The people who made Newpedia fail were the people who made Wikipedia succeed. When Sanger needed people to try out his wiki, he didn't go out to the public internet and say, come one, come all, let's try this thing. He went to the people who'd worked with him for nine months trying to build an encyclopedia a different way. And he relied on those people. They'd built up enough trust and enough of a sensibility of what their goal were that they were willing to try something new. And he didn't go to them with a big promise that this wiki thing was going to be the victory. He went to them hat in hand. He went to them very modestly. He said, look, this may not work. Humor me. Go there. Try it. It will take you all of five minutes. Right? The output of Newpedia wasn't a failed encyclopedia and a dead URL. The output of Newpedia were the people willing to try something else. Wikipedia, the most widely used encyclopedia in the history of the world, is Plan B. That ability, the ability to build up among a group of people a sense of trust and a sense of focus so that they can try something new is very often the critical output here. Now that may not be you. When you design a project, your plan A may work great. It happens sometimes, but it's not the normal case. And as you're setting out to do whatever it is you want to do, or for those of you who have been through this process, as you've done whatever you've done. The important thing to recognize is you're building up your own ability to understand the problem. Whatever else happens when you set out, that's the precious resource. One of the best hardware, hardware prototypers I've ever known, Benedetta Pianotella, came to visit one of my classes. And she said, I used to think I would build the first prototype to show the client a solution to their problem. But I've come to realize that you build the first prototype to show the client that they don't yet understand the problem. Right? Very often, you don't get people to even tell you what it is that they need until you can show them something that is concretely wrong. Right? That, that ability, the ability to say, we're doing all the planning we can, we're learning everything about the problem we can, we're heading off in this direction, is useful. You have to do that. But you also have to say, we're also setting out with the sense that 
we're the important resource. The people working on this and our ability to learn from this and change our minds is what's going to make or break this over the long haul. Because across the history of large, successful projects, almost nothing ended up the way it started out. And when you look at the groups that made things work, what you see is that it isn't, it isn't, how they, it isn't what they did first that mattered. It was what they did next. So thank you all, and good luck. <laughs>